Um, on behalf of the Board of Directors of INSECA, I'd like to welcome you to this panel on interdisciplinary art and psychology. Um, I'm here to remind you to please, at this moment, turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. Um, to tell you that this is this panel is bound to spark very interesting conversations, but we should have them after the panel and not during the presentation. Um, and I'm also here to remind those of you who are members, which should be about all of you at this point, to please vote today before four o'clock for your director at large and student DAL as well. You can do that on the Inseca app or you can go downstairs in registration and see Candace and it will only take a moment for you to do that. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you again for coming and I am going to introduce you to Aisha and let her go from here. Okay, thank you. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're awake. Um, so I just wanted to thank Nsika for having this talk. Um, this is kind of a labor of love that we've been working on for a long time, um, this class. And so what we're going to talk about is um, our class. So th this class has been going for 20 weeks, and this is sort of the end of our 20 weeks. So I wanted to introduce um, uh, so my name is Aisha Harrison. I teach at Evergreen State College. Um, I'm an artist. I'm a mother. I'm lots of things. Um, this is Professor Kana. So uh, she is a psychologist, a amazing teacher, um, a clinical psychologist, and an expressive arts therapist. So we designed this course together. Um, me as an artist and her as an expressive arts therapist, and I'm talking about race and identity um, through the arts. So I also wanted to introduce our students. So if you're a student in this AMP, we call it AMP, um, Art, Mindfulness, and Psychology was the name of the class, uh, Racial Identity Through the Lifespan, super long. So we just shortened it to AMP. Um, so could AMP students stand up? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Okay, so some of the students uh, will be, uh, some of their work is presented here. Some of them will also be speaking towards the end of the talk um, about uh, showing kind of an interdisciplinary mode that they worked on, a research project they worked on this quarter. So without further ado, um, Mr. well, I'm not going to say they're by. You can read their names. <laughs> but. Um, so we want to say that the demographics in higher education are shifting, thank goodness. Um, even if your school is not changing, um, it, it, they, it, this will happen throughout the country. This is not something that's um, going to change. We're going to all move towards um, a more diverse higher ed experience. And so, um, and even if your particular institution is not um, getting more diverse, there's still uh, ways to think about um, how to teach in a way that doesn't exclude people from your pedagogy, from your content. And the people that would, might be excluded are um, people of color, first-generation college students, immigrant students, um, students with disabilities. There's many, many ways that we um, as educators, maybe sometimes miss some of the things that we could teach. Um, and so some of the thoughts we, wanted, we want you to think about is um, how could our teaching be more culturally relevant to the people who we are teaching? Um, how could we uh, make our pedagogy more accessible, more interesting, more relevant? Um, and then who does your particular um, teaching and pedagogy benefit the most? And then what does that mean? So uh, now I'm gonna introduce here Mukti. She's going to talk about um, our college for a minute. So we are from the Evergreen State College, which is a public liberal arts college in Olympia, Washington, just two hours north of here. And our college is based on the principle of students working collectively in learning communities. These are uh, 
programs that vary from two to 16 credits, and they can be anywhere from one to three academic quarters. Our college really values interdisciplinary teaching, which is how this particular interdisciplinary pairing came together. And we often work with faculty in different disciplines to design curriculum, particularly to address emergent issues. We have no departments, no majors, no requirements, and yet it's still a tremendous amount of work for both faculty and students. Our curriculum is based around five learning principles, five foci, and six expectations, which we'll briefly introduce to you. So the five foci are interdisciplinary study, collaborative learning, learning across significant differences, personal engagement, and linking theory with practical applications. And all of those um, foci were things that we attempted to address in our program. And you can scan these six expectations, and I think the one you might find very interesting is particularly number five, applying qualitative, quantitative, and creative modes of inquiry, the exact kind of work you do as artists, art educators to solve and explore practical and theoretical problems across disciplines. So we really value communicating both creatively and effectively. So as we were designing this program, we tried to come up with some core questions that we would try to get to, um, maybe not answer, but ask um, as an open inquiry. And so um, some of the questions were, how can mindfulness and art making be integrated into working with people at various developmental and racial identity stages of life? How do systems of racial identity live in the individual, family, and social bodies? How can the practices of mindfulness and creating art be integral to the healing of racism, and what does the healing of racism look like? So we had two different sections of our program. Um, some, some students were in a 16 credit program, so that means that it's like four classes all mushed into one class. So that's four, so some of the, half the students were in a 16 credit class, and the other half were in an eight credit class. And we met um, all day long for the 16 credit, and then the, the eight credit only met in the evening. So we're mostly gonna talk about the, what happened in the evening section of the program, um, but this is a little bit about the day, the day program. So we do have students who enrolled for 16 credits, the equivalent of four, four credit classes, and this was a huge commitment, 40 hours of work per week as mandated by our state educational standards. So these students were also in the evening part of the program as well. This provided them prerequisites and lifespan human development, important for teacher education, also some work in quantitative reasoning for social sciences, cultural, sci cultural studies, and applied mindfulness across the lifespan. So in the eight credit, um, that's when we met an, in the evening, and that's the part that I was, uh, we worked together on. And so um, it was only half, half time program, so eight credits. Um, we, we, in this part, we specifically talked about racial identity, structural racism. Um, we did a mindfulness practice. We did ceramics and drawing. We did um, different body-related intermodal <laughs> expressive arts. Um, we connected to the larger community. We uh, did some professional art practices like coming to Ensika. We put up a show, and we also published a zine. So our students were very wide ranging. So sophomore to senior, um, beginning ceramic people who never touched clay before to advanced ceramic people who I've had or have been in the ceramics for a long time. So we have to develop a curriculum that can really expand um, in that way, which is actually really, uh, it's a challenge, but it's very, uh, it's a good challenge because what it means is the, the advanced people kind of can inspire the new people, and the new people can, um, you know, can help sort of get the old people out of old patterns. I mean, there's just so many things that you can do, right? And the more advanced people can teach also, so that's something that we um, focused on too. Uh, so, yeah, and it also creates this kind of sense of studio 
a studio where there's people who are working there a lot, right? So that people could come in and ask questions and um, get feedback and all kinds of things. So also our students come from a wide variety of backgrounds, um, not only in terms of race, but cultural, economic, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious background, immigration history, familiar structures, physical abilities, and then of course the intersections of all those things together. Um, and our students also came from all over the country. These are some of the texts that all students studied, uh, particularly in the evening portion of the work. And part of our work was to explore how engaging with racial identity and structural racism could, could be had in a learning community with a very diverse group of people who stand at the crossroads of many identities. So these texts in the evening were both personal narratives as well as social science research. So, as we've said, this, these intersections, what we're talking about is um, somebody might have a certain amount of social capital in one area, like they might be um, physically able, but they also might have uh, maybe less social capital in another, maybe they're a black woman. Does that make sense? So there's like these ways that um, different privileges sort of go together to create who we are, in some ways, who we are. Um, so our identities. <clears throat> so, and while we know that that is true, that everybody has, stands at these crossroads, we did decide to, to intentionally focus our class on race and racial identity. And the reason, part of the reason we did that is because uh, a lot of discussions about race get sort of um, veered, they veer off. <laughs> um, because people are uncomfortable talking about race. It's a very difficult thing to talk about as our class went through. I mean, in our, within our class, many of the things that come up with outside, outside of society happened in our class too, even though we were being super intentional. And so that's just the nature of the work and, and to push through that work, um, we made art. <laughs> that was part of our, our work. Um, so uh, there's also this idea that sometimes um, different people like to say, um, oh, well, I experience um, you know, disadvantage too, so I totally get what you mean by ra like what racism is all about. And that's just, uh, so we're trying to, we were trying to avoid that. We call it a me tooism, um, that sort of false equivalencies. They're not, they're not the same, right? There, there might be some, um, some correlations, but if you don't talk about, if, you're, if you wanna just move toward class because that's easier to talk about than race, um, what we would say to that is, well, what if you bring race and class together? Then what are you gonna talk about, right? That's the intersection. So you can't just talk about class. Does that make sense? Okay. So the idea was to sort of meet students where they were at with all these things. We recognized that the students that are the students we brought in would have um, would be a, on a wide range of um, of racial identities, right? And that we are also, me and Professor Kana are also on a, a, a place of racial identity. So nobody's done. This work is never done. When you're working with a diverse group, people are going to be at different stages of racial identity development. Um, and this is a fluid process, so people continue to grow, develop, and evolve over time. This is a lifetime work. Our seminar model of discussing text took this into account, and we used some work based on the work of Nathaniel Rutstein of Healing Racism with a model that looked at racism as a disease and really had more of a talking circle model with no crosstalk. This was very intentional to allow students to hear the voices of other people and not have someone's perspective in 
unconsciously invalidated, which can often happen in open discussions. We did have some guidelines that were modified by its students to address the seminar to really make a place where, where perspectives could be heard, acknowledging that everyone was at different stages of racial identity development and continued to be as the process unfolded. We did a wide variety of assignments in class, and we'll mention a couple of them here. Uh, Aisha Harrison will talk more about the art-centered projects in a few moments. So we worked with experiential learning, studio arts, and many other events. We ha attended community events and lectures. Uh, this image that you see here is a contemplative art space we had on the election night in November, and we, none of us could have imagined how that night was going to unfold as it went along. The students designed and facilitated different spaces, drawing spaces, writing spaces, clay spaces, uh, touch drawing spaces, where people could be able to reflect on what their experience was of the election as a whole. And so these are some of the stations that we saw, see here. In preparation for the election, we also had some uh, staff who worked closely with our program from the Quantitative Reasoning Center do workshops about gerrymandering. And here you can see uh, a simulation of how to make it work. So the puppy party almost always wins, or the turtle party always wins, or the kitty party almost wins. And this really brought home theory to practice of what's happening in our country in a way students could understand by just drawing lines and making different parties win no matter what. Uh, so this helped to lead up to different, uh, a deeper understanding that then was channeled into the art making. So here's some of the other events that we went to. Um, this was the 30 Americans exhibition that was at the Tacoma Art Museum. We were so uh, fortunate to have that occur during the same time as our class. So the 30 Americans exhibition was uh, is a group, of, well, it's a group of, of art from an influential group of prominent um, African American artists who have emerged as leading contributors to the contemporary art scene um, in the United States. We also uh, went to a talk by Nate Bowling. Um, he won Teacher of the Year, and he teaches in Tacoma, and a couple of our students were students of his, so that was kind of a nice connection. And he also went to Evergreen, um, and so there's, it's, it's, it was a nice thing. But he talked about um, teaching and learning across significant differences, especially after the post-Trump era, um, and how, how to navigate some of those um, issues. And then we also had Laura Ramirez come and speak. Um, she talked about the missing 40, 43 in Ayotzinapa in southern Mexico. And they were disappeared on September 26, 2014. And so she spent a great deal of time talking about the art that, was cre that has been created and is continuing to be created um, uh, to bring awareness to these issues. We worked with Intermodal Expressive Arts Forum to deepen into the ceramics art and drawing studies. One of the forms we used was Touch Drawing, which is an intuitive art form developed by Deborah Koff Chapin. We're very much like ceramics, where you're working with your hands. You use your hands as a natural paintbrush to move your hands across a board that has water-based ink with tissue paper or other paper on top, and you use that to source feelings, senses, impressions. The power of this process is you can make one image after another after another. They're not necessarily finished products, so it's a fantastic way of processing strong reactions, thoughts, emotions in relation to some of the content and texts we were exploring, as well as sourcing concepts for some more conceptual art that you might be developing. And here we have uh, the group doing the touch drawing in, in the field. So you, there's also a power of making art collectively. I feel there's a collective resonance when everyone's working to co collectively in a field that deepens the creativity, incubation, and understanding. Mm -hmm. 
So another one of the things that we did, uh, and we're doing currently, uh, is we brought our students to Inseca. So it just happened to be in Portland. Um, it just worked out, which is an amazing thing. Um, and so we put up an exhibition last night <laughs> um, at a space that is, it's not um, in the conference program because of the timing, but um, it is only three miles from here, and we'll hand out postcards at the end, so if you're interested, you can please stop by. Um, it's going to be open today and tomorrow, and it's at uh, uh, the Multnomah Friends Meeting House. The program is called Art, Mindfulness, and Psychology, Racial Identity Development Through the Lifespan. Over the two quarters, we worked with two applied mindfulness protocols, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which are eight-week programs, structured programs with both formal and informal mindfulness practices of being able to focus your attention in the moment on thoughts, emotions, and body sensations. This took discipline and commitment with practices starting from five-minute practices to up to 40-minute body scans. In the fall, when we were studying child uh, birth chi and child development, we did this practice. For any of you working with um, latency age, children might find this Dr. Saltzman book very helpful, A Still Quiet Place, a mindfulness practice program for teaching children and adolescents to ease stress and difficult emotions. We went through it as if we were kids and adolescents. And in the winter, we worked with more of an adult protocol, the Mindful Way Workbook, an eight-week program, which was about mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, but not just for depression and emotional distress. We really worked to apply the mindfulness into staying present with difficult discussions on race, racial identity, to have a pause between your perception and your reaction, and to be really mindful when making art, creativity, and to open up neural, neural networks for deep creativity that could happen through, through mindfulness practice that could then be expressed in the art. We also worked with embodied practice. This is a college-wide event of Tai Chi, a moving meditation and philosophy with Master Chung Leong Al Huang, who himself presented in Sika many years ago, centering on the wheel with MC Richards. Uh, we worked with a five moving forces form of earth, water, air, metal, and wood to be able to have a practice to ground and center ourselves, also in connection with the natural world. We worked with uh, intermodal embodied exploration, really paying attention to thoughts, feelings, and bodily reactions. So we would have maybe processes that might lead to listening and sensing in the body. These are students listening and sensing where are their spheres of influence. And they're actually sitting inside different concentric circles, which you can't quite see there, and then moving into different circles and free writing about that. We wanted them to sense that in a whole bodied way, and then maybe do some writing, and then take that into their art making. This is a different exploration than just sitting at a desk and writing what might come, come to mind, and I really, I'm thankful our students are very open to these kind of creative intermodal journeys. This can be any combination of art, movement, writing, writing, moving art. We did some interactive theater explorations. What I, we do know, and I know from my doctoral research in the creative process, is when you move from one modality to the other, to the other, you're more likely to have a creative breakthrough. If you're mainly a visual artist, then if you do some music or sound work, that will enhance your ability to have a creative breakthrough in your primary art form. So I'm going to move into um, how we and I designed the integrated art of, of from this program. Um, so again, we had a wide range of skill skill level in the ceramics and also in the racial identity, um, and so. Uh, we, we wanted the students to leave the program with certain s certain skill sets um, and also make these projects that would explore racial identity, structural racism, and the text that we read. So we did some drawing. Um, this is sort of an introductory 
you know, I just did basic introductions to drawing. Um, so this is one of the gesture, gesture drawings that we did right after a mindfulness practice, like a body scan type mindfulness practice. So then they sat with their eyes closed and kind of felt where the tension and weight was in their bodies. And those were the places where they spent more time making circles. Does that make sense? So we just sort of combined um, the mindfulness and the drawing f fairly frequently. Um, we also drew during class, so we would read, um, sometimes we would read a quote, um, and then we would draw, they would draw about the quote, and maybe write a little thing down, and then we would share some of those drawings or some of the reflections from those quotes. Sometimes we shared in pairs, and then sometimes we would share out to the group as well. Um, and then we did this uh, synthesis drawing and image, uh, synthesis image and writing every week as well. And so the student would uh, do a drawing and then write about that drawing. And so um, these were slightly more planned than the ones that we did um, during class. Um, so they would sort of try to synthesize all the stuff that we did that week. And they were supposed to do it after. We did this thing called integration on Thursday. It was just kind of a song. We, we sang <laughs> every week. Um, and after integration, then they, would, they were supposed to sort of think about what came out that week and then make a drawing and then do some writing about that drawing. So here's a few uh, samples from that. Some of the drawings got quite detailed, as you can see there. And then this is an example of what it looked like in the actual journal. So we encouraged them to write by hand so that um, it was more of an embodied experience of writing rather than typing, which is kind of a not, <laughs> not embodied experience. Um, Okay, and so when it came to ceramics projects, um, I was really doing this multi-level thing, and so the the assignments were, they had a um, a, a how-to part, a surface part, and then a content part. So um, the first assignment was the cup of experience, the pl and and the plate of messages. Um, so these are some samples from the cup of experience plate of messages. I'll just show another. Um, so the method that I showed um, for the cup uh, was either pinching or we did, um, you know, you, you take a tube and wrap a thing around it, it's like slab, and then you could sort of change it to whatever shape you wanted for the cup. Um, but then there were other people who were more advanced, so they did other things. So I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Um, and then the, the plate of experience was a more kind of a laid into a, a mold, right? Like a slump mold. So um, here are a couple more cups of experience. And the cup was the piece where they could reflect about their experience of racial identity. And then the plate reflected the messages they received about their racial identity from outside sources. So, um, Really, the, the cup was more of their personal, um, their internal feelings and experiences, and then the, the message, the plate was more of their external, what they've been fed, right? So we, I encourage them to think about the, the actual meaning of a plate and a cup. A cup is something we or is very intimate. We put it to our mouth. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very personal. The plate is something we are served on, right? It's this thing that's like in front of us with the food on top. So we talked about um, we talked about the the use of these things, like how useful was the cup of messages you received. Um, so, so for surface for this project, um, I introduced slip, underglaze, and glaze as surface options. And then I also demonstrated Scraffito, Newspaper Resist, and Slip Inlay. So that was all the first project. Hello. Hello. So here's some more examples from there, from that project. These are all cups. And then for more advanced students, um, we worked together to figure out how they could make use a technique that they wanted to use, but still do the assignment. So the, the content was their part of the assignment, and many of them pushed their ideas and made several iterations from the one assignment. So this was a cup and a plate together. <laughs> I was, I'm loose. So 
if, I, if I mean a plate, I, I'm, I'm open to what that means for you, right? Here's some more kind of more traditionally plate-looking plate plates. <laughs> so while we were actually developing these plates and cups, we were reading about um, the develop, racial identity development for lots of different um, folks, how that happens, because it's not the same for everyone. Um, we were using the Cross and the Helms models of racial identity, and that's offered in the Beverly Daniel Tatum book, which is a, a good uh, starter book for anybody who's interested in this topic. Um, we also did some creative writing explorations. I tried to do, we tried to do some kind of creative writing or drawing um, to the touch drawing, some way to deepen uh, beyond just thinking about racial identity, like getting it, getting into a deeper state with it. So we did these creative writing explorations uh, adapted from the work of Ira Progoff, um, which I'm happy to talk to anybody about later. Um, but it's an amazing process where you, you, delve in, you delve pretty deep into your subconscious and you dig stuff out. <laughs> but you can leave stuff there too, so it's not um, a process where you're just taking everything out, right? You get to choose what comes out for you. So here's some more plates. And then the second project, um, first quarter, so this is a two quarter program, so the second project, first quarter, uh, was a box project where we talked uh, about the exterior of the box being kind of a mask that you put on when racism comes up. And then the interior of the box being, um, if you put on a mask, right? So maybe some of you don't. Um, but then the interior of the box is how you really feel in that situation. So we did some more um, prograph writing and things about that. Um, and so we acknowledged in this project that some of the masks are necessary to, for some of us. Um, they're developed for safety reasons. And that some of the masks were used to kind of um, make it so we didn't have to think about how we were complicit with racism. Um, we used, again, lots of different ways to, to get to how to, what to make. Many of the students with uh, European descent used porcelain as a way to talk about white fragility, ideas of purity, and lenses of whiteness. So here's an example of that. So for this uh, project, I demoed, as you can sort of see, uh, I demoed slab construction. And then I also added uh, terra sigillata stains and plaster, slip, plaster slab slip transfer um, as possible surfaces that they could try. Um, one thing that we did do is uh, we videotaped um, all the demos, and as soon as we could get them uploaded, we did. Um, and so what that did was it made it so that students who uh, had trouble absorbing all of the information at once could watch it again. Students who were absent for whatever reason could watch it. And then also, since we had a two-quarter program, some students uh, fluxed out of the program and some students fluxed into the program. So we had 10 brand new students. Um, at the beginning of second quarter. So then they could go back and watch those original demos and catch up to sort of technique-wise where we were. Does that make sense? So, so in the second quarter, I wanted to uh, shift the focus. Um, um, instead of just being a purely sort of internal discovery process, I wanted to really explicitly use parts of the text to inform uh, the work and be the basis for the sculptures. And we moved definitely towards sculpture. Um, and so what we did uh, was we started with the book Citizen uh, by Claudia Rankin. And they chose a quote from that book after they finished it. And then um, they did a bunch of work about the quote. Why did they choose the quote? What does the quote have to do with them? Um, what is the quote really trying to say? What could they learn um, more about the quote? How could they? think about it, who, you know, they just sort of like mold over the quote for a long time. <laughs> and then they designed a piece um, to make. And this was sort of a larger project, so they only made one very large, you know, one sort of ceramics project the second quarter. 
Um, but we built solid, which is the way I build at home. Um, we use steel pipe armatures um, and just, you know, plum we just use plumbing fittings. And so, and then they learned how to hollow things out. So they sort of learned a new process. And then some of them brought old processes from the prior quarter into this project as well. So you can see these here. And then I taught them for surfaces for this project, um, I taught them a lot of different cold temperature surfaces. So, and they went over terra sigillata and slip. So they could sort of try, I mean, they're sculptures, so I don't, I'm not a purist, <laughs> but maybe some of you are. Some of them are purists. Um, and so they, uh, the advanced students did their own um, atmospheric firings as well for this project. Um, so the advanced students were able to complete extra projects because these projects didn't, I mean, they were in depth for them, but they could make multiples from one prompt. Um, and I encouraged them to work in series like that. And so um, here's a piece and one of more, more advanced people. And then um, this is another advanced student. So this student made um, many of these boxes. These are uh, based on um, the ceramic pillow traditions. So thinking about, well, you can, you can think about that. <laughs> um, and so you should come see all of this work. Okay. So the last project we did, um, this last quarter, I mean, this past quarter, which just ended, I mean, it's still happening. They're sitting right here. Um, but it was a drawing project. And so in this project, I wanted to um, really connect the art making with um, who they're trying to communicate to. So we added that as a layer. So that we read uh, this bridge called My Back, radical, uh, writings by radical women of color. And then they chose another quote from that book. They delved into that a bunch. We did some bunch of different things about that. And then we also sat in the spheres of influence um, circles and thought about who, what could we communicate from this quote and who could we communicate it to? And how could we communicate it to that person or group? So one of the circles is yourself. So maybe this is a, a self-care piece, right? But there's also people outside of yourself to communicate these things to. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, before the, uh, we, before, we sort of, we, so we did lots of different modes of ways of thinking about this, um, this thing. So I wanna show you some of their drawings. And it was a drawing project, again. So here's some of the drawings that came from this project. So it was very interesting to combine the drawing and the ceramics. So they were doing drawing, but it wasn't, we, we sort of did an intensive drawing session towards the end of the second quarter. But it, drawing was just sort of throughout, mingled throughout the whole time. Um, and so many of them had some drawing skill that they brought to the program. Um, so you can see some of that coming out here. So we also had other projects that used the arts. Um, so this is, we did a cultural history project. Um, and the cultural history project, we asked them to do family interviews. We asked them to interview, if they could, two generations and themselves. This is a complicated uh, project because that doesn't always work for every student. So we tried to work with people to figure out who they could interview or how they could get around interviewing. Not everyone has a relationship with their family where that's going to work out. And so we were sensitive to that. Um, they also uh, did some research about some aspect of their cultural history, um, something. And then they found a book. We did some uh, sort of groupings. So we had some people sort of in caucus groups um, or affinity groups where they shared the books that they found. They each had to find five books and then they chose one. But they, when they had the five, they, would, they gotten in a group and shared together which ones they found and which ones they were interested in. Um, so that they, is, it's actually a, you know, you would walk away from that group with 20 books that you might want to read eventually, right? So it was a, a develop, you know, a, it developed 
possibilities for the future. But anyway, they chose one book and they read it. And then they had to sort of figure out how their family related to the content of that book. Um, and then they did art, an art project uh, related to it as well. And a genogram, so I'll show you some of the art. A genogram is like a family tree, but a little more, with more stuff on it. And then they also wrote a paper at the end reflecting on all the pieces that they learned. So all of this work was done completely at home. We didn't see it until um, the sharing. And for, to share these, we had we set up sort of a, um, what was that, what's that called? Like a, a, fair. a fair, like a science fair sort of thing, where everybody set up their little booth, um, and then they could talk to each other about what they, their art, mostly their art and their genogram. And some people wrote also. So there were lots of poets, poets um, writing about this. And here's an, oh, you want to, I'll save. There's an example, this is an example of a genogram. So you can see they, some of them were like this and some of them were very simple, but. Yeah, and this genogram, you can see the student's identity highlighted in the white rectangle and you can see the many lineages of generational ancestors as well as generations yet to come, which helps students have a much deeper sense of themselves connected to a stream of identity and how their particular racial identity and the moments we're in now in 2017 may fit with generational histories that may involve intermarriage, immigration, acculturation, many other kinds of dialogues. Um, I'm going to share some slides created by student groups to help set up some concepts about how one of the interdisciplinary focuses we looked at was the neurophysiology of racism and how that might be expressed both in terms of pain and resilience at different stages across the lifespan. So I'm just going to introduce some key concepts with some slides that were created by some of our students and then some of our students will come and speak about some of their understanding of how neuroscience and racism may happen at different points in the lifespan and the role of arts in healing and resilience. So this is the hand model of the brain, and if you could hold up this yeah. book. This is a, a model by Dr. Daniel Siegel of UCLA. This book, Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain. If you're teaching high school, I recognize our presenter from yesterday. I highly recommend this, this book to try to understand the brain. So when, as ceramic artists, you're deeply involved with your hands all the time, and your hand can also be a powerful and really useful model of the brain. So I invite you just to hold up your hand for a second, a little bit of experiential work here, and then fold your thumb into the center of your palm, and then fold your fingers over your thumb. And if you turn this towards you, you have a model that can replicate the brain inside the head. And this is from Dr. Daniel Siegel. So the front part, the fingers, are the cortex. This supports abstract thinking, thought, analysis, and decision making. And as we studied in lifespan human development, this part of the brain is not fully online till age 24 or 25, which leads to great creativity and ideas in adolescence and also risky decisions. So it can go both ways. I know you, you all who work with high school understand that. If you lift up your fingers here, this thumb, this is the amygdala, which is an almond-shaped structure deep inside the brain, deep inside the thumb. This is your emotions, feelings, emotional memories. This is the source of where a lot of deep art ideas for creativity come from. And then if you lift up your thumb, on the palm is the brain stem which are the vital bodily functions, blood, blood pressure, swallowing, breathing, heartbeat, sleeping. And the brain is not alone. It connects to the nervous system. So your wrist would be the spinal cord that goes down. So if we want to put that back together, the brain is connected to the nervous system. And there are many parts of the nervous system, polyvagal, many parts. So to ha put it back with this hand model, this brain stem part is the things you don't consciously control that keep us alive, heart, bre breathing, respiration, sleep. And then if you put your thumb back into the brain model, I encourage you to put your thumb back in the hand. 
this is the emotional part, the amygdala. When we're threatened by racism, if someone's going to commit an act of violence against someone, they're in a fight mode. Their amygdala is on high alert like this. The same way if someone feels a threat from being a focus of a racist actum, their amygdala is also on high alert. So the idea is to balance this. And the way you balance that is through the ventral vagal nerve. If you fold your fingers back over your thumb, the thumb and the front fingers form the social nervous system. And when this is open, this runs from the front of the body here. We're socially engaged. We're connected with, with each other and ourselves. It keeps us from withdrawing but also from dehumanizing and committing violence against other people. This is from Dr. Stephen Porges, University of Chicago Mind Body Medicine Lab, and we're finding keeping this ventral vagal nerve open is more important in terms of being human, resilient, and social connection, probably helpful in preventing racist acts of violence. So the arts help us, like ceramics, keep us vital as you go through senescence and aging. When the ventral vagal nerve is open, you can express through creativity. The neuroscience suggests finding meaning in life can lead to longevity. And these are some examples of student-created art that students are expressing the pain of racism. And you can feel the profound depth of this in these images, as well as art to show healing that can come through the creative process. And when this ventral vagal nervous system, your whole brain is online, you have that joy, resilience, integration, and self-regulation. So it's a deep honor to present just some of our students sharing some of their thoughts about how they are integrating neurophysiology, science, and art in creatively confronting racism. Hello everyone, um, so our group focused on the emerging adulthood, uh, which would be ages 18 to 24. Raise your hand if like you're anywhere within that age range. So yeah, this applies to all of us. And if you teach people in this age range or like you think people in this age range um, might be exposed to your artwork in any form, um, this applies to you, so it's important. Um, so we're focusing on creatively confronting racism by decolonizing our brains through our art. Um, and what's important about this is that there are many ways to confront racism, and some of us do it through our art, through our processing, and through our sharing of our art in ways um, that others can also explore those uh, modes. Uh, so here we go. Hi. Um, so emerging adulthood is a stage of life that includes ages 18 to 24 at the end of adolescence. Um, a unique part of emerging adulthood is that thinking becomes more practical, flexible, creative, and imaginative. And these are all things that can help us with our art and ceramics work. Um, this type of thinking is also called post-formal post thought, which is a stage of cognitive, de cognitive development. Um, this image shows the changes in the brain during emerging adulthood. We continue to make new brain connections throughout life. Um, at this stage, this brain's, the, the brain is making connections between emotions and thought and integrating them together. The purple part shows the changes in the prefrontal cortex during this stage. The green and blue part show the increases in speech processing areas. And the yellow part shows the increases in visual processing areas. So um, as creativity and flexibility are developing, um, when I thought uh, stereotypes, including racial stereotypes, are also being challenged. So even though there is more cognitive flexibility and more rational tolerance at this stage, there are still unconscious prejudices and implicit biases we all have that don't disappear at this stage. And many people don't recognize their own stereotypes or internalized prejudices. Um, this is, um, this is an example of what I think can happen when the brain uh, is being put to the test to be rational or to rely on stereotypes and emotion. Uh, age, agent of racism, 
refers to a person who carries out a racist act, and in this case, I'm looking at an agent who unintentionally becomes an agent of racism, even though they logically see themselves as not being racist. Um, and so this cartoon is kind of a synthesis of what I've absorbed from our readings, um, of that there's an emotional side of the brain and a logical side, and um, someone in the logical side of their brain can be saying, I'm not a racist person, I understand racism, I don't want to continue these stereotypes, but if they're in fight or flight mode, feeling triggered because of, um, for example, they're feeling a personal bias about someone's race and they're trying to avoid being racist, um, that emotional side of the brain can come out and, <laughs> in my cartoon, squash the, um, the, logic, uh, the logical side of the brain and result in a person saying or doing uh, something racist. Uh, this is an example of when unpl un implicit biases and stereotypes can come out and be hurtful. Um, and similarly, uh, this slide looks at someone being a victim of racism, a target of racism. A uh, victim may have a goal in mind they want to accomplish, but in fight or flight mode because of being stereotyped or experiencing racial prejudice, their emotional side of their brain um, at this time can be squashed uh, and their uh, memory and learning can cause, uh, can be squashed and their self-doubt uh, or doubt of one's abilities can can be the result. Um, at this emerging adulthood stage and beyond into adulthood, we're making lots of connections between logic and emotional parts of our brain. Um, so those two sides again. Uh, so this is a critical time to be examining racial stereotypes in our own world and explore our own implicit biases and internalized racism, uh, things that have been fed to us through media or culture or families um, so that we can combat these forces in our daily lives uh, one thing we've been looking at in our class, as was mentioned, is how we can integrate our thoughts and feelings about race through our art and journaling, um, about the books we read or the quotes and whatnot. Uh, art making can be a way to examine our emotional side of our brain and connect it to the logical side of our brain, and this allows us to explore ways to challenge the implicit biases and oppressions in ourselves. Oh, I'm not quite sure. I don't know. That's not good. Uh -oh. I don't know how else to. Let's see. It's coming. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Keep coming. One moment, please. <laughs> There's still a job of testing. There we go. Okay. It's the okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this slide is basically to represent a mirror or a reflection of how our society, in some ways, um, is most likely to process like the way that we teach art into a Eurocentric mold and how that's kind of like seen as uh, the standard for most uh, beginning teaching techniques. So this also looks at um, terms and sense of accessibility and who has accessibility to art. And if um, certain folks, like let's say their school doesn't fund an art program, how are they gonna learn art? They're most likely gonna turn to the internet, especially um, in this younger age of like um, kids just being more comfortable in that kind of realm of trying to find answers to things, right? So um, this is really important to a lot of people, I think. So when you're looking for uh, resources and references, one of the things you'll notice, like if you were to Google, or I guess in this case, Bing, um, how to draw a face, what do you notice like about all the faces? They all kind of have a very similar um, aesthetic to them, right? So they all have very Eurocentric features. And so what this does on a wide scale, um, it can affect people both in the literal practice and the physical doing of the, the practice of drawing, but also in the internalizing of like these standards um, for what is normal or what is um, kind of like 
who is being drawn and who isn't. And so what we wanna do when we challenge this is how as teachers and as creators, um, how can we help kind of change this idea of like institutionalizing a very certain um, way of learning about art and who gets to be drawn and who gets to be represented and how can we do that? And so we're just suggesting um, some of the things that our teacher, Aisha, was really kind um, in showing us and really focusing less on like a standard of proportions and more just like looking at our own proportions um, and thinking about like what difference that brings to kind of representing ourselves as truly as possible and others as well. Um, so just the practice of drawing different people of different races, body types, skin tones, practicing those things and teaching your students that those things are possibilities, especially when you're teaching students of color. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so we did our project on the neuroscience of racism in elderly folks. Um, I'm Sarah Wozniak. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Or? Sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chrislyn Moore. Catherine Spinner. Raven Cooper. Hi, my name is Umang Varma. Um, here we're talking late, about, oh, late adulthood. The brain reaches a standstill in physical growth and gradually begins to shrink in total volume and weight. Because of this, some integrative processes slow down in part of the brain which, the part of the brain which experiences the most degeneration during the time uh, are the frontal lobes, the front, frontmost part of your hand model, um, if you guys remember the hand model. In order to cope with this degeneration, brains optimize themselves by strengthening deeper pathways. Um, no, I can't see. Um, in the brain, as depicted in our graphic, elderly people can begin to resort to thinking founded on their childhood such as believing that segregating people based on race is normal. So the frontal lobe may help keep executive functions of the brain, such as selective attention, in line. Selective attention is the ability to choose which thoughts to pay attention to when the brain decides to think many things. So racial stereotypes have been shown to dwell within most people's brains, and uh, people do not want their, uh, sorry, <laughs> within most people's brains, and people do not want their behavior to be affected by these judgments, but older adults may have a harder time shutting down stereotypical judgment. Stereotypes concerning people of color have become overlearned because of their deep presence throughout American history, media, politics, education, and culture. Studies have shown that these assumptions automatically activate when white people encounter people of color, even when they say they don't want to. The structural pervasiveness of stereotypes combined with the prejudice and power can cause people of color to internalize these behaviors and stereotypes. This is known as stereotype threat, and it can create barriers for people of color to good health and intelligence. Push the green button. Older adults have experienced life in such a way that their perceptions of the world are deeply embedded. In order to unlearn stereotypes, we believe that older adults must be more socially engaged. A controlled study of art programs for elders, age 65 through 105, showed significant benefits. Elders involved in arts activities had fewer doctor visits, lower rates of depression, and more social contact 
than those carrying on their usual activities without arts programming. Um, scientists believe there is a branch of our autonomic nervous system. Um, can you, I can't read the text oh, from here. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. It's okay. Um, scientists believe that there is a branch of our autonomic nervous system called the social nervous system. And uh, we theorize that because many older adults are isolated from the rest of society, their social nervous system isn't stimulated. Uh, this makes it difficult for them to unlearn stereotypes that they picked up when they were younger. Um, the social nervous system possesses a nerve, which our professor Kunda talked about, that runs down the front and center of one's body. Um, this nerve is called the ventral vagal nerve, and when it's open and sensitive, uh, a person can feel for others' emotions and make social connections, or they're more open to that. Art making, especially in groups, can keep older people, social, older adults socially engaged. Creating or appreciating art can also contribute to the brain's fluidity by maintaining a sense of novelty and dynamism. So uh, Catherine talked about this. Um, this is the slide uh, talking about older adults and art groups. Uh, creativity allows for the storytelling part of the mind to meet with the rational mind uh, and create an aesthetic expression of feelings and experiences otherwise uncommunicable. This was drawn by one of our group members, uh, Chrislyn Moore. That's one of mine. I wanted to draw an expression of kind of understanding the brain's need to reach out to community and ideas and a collective. And um, I chose a pea plant because I wanted to represent um, how much time it takes to really nurture these things and how much patience is required, just no matter who you are and what age group you belong to and what stage of this you're at. Um, and then I put a sky behind it because I wanted to represent um, kind of this brightness and how this can be a hard topic to look at and how, you know, the sky is beautiful when we, you know, risk that pain to our eyes or that discomfort and it's worthwhile in the end to really delve into this this way. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a, a quote from um, Bell Hooks from Teaching to Transgress. And it says, professors who em embrace the challenge of self-actualization will be better able to create pedagogical practices that engage students, providing them with ways of knowing that enhance their capacity to live fully and deeply. And so some of um, what we did was learn through our process how to modify the um, class every class. <laughs> so the students often gave us feedback um, about what was going well, what wasn't, and we took all of it. Um, we were very open to feedback. So we want to thank you all for um, all of your feedback. It means a lot. Um, I was going to talk more about that, but we don't have time. But I'm uh, very uh, appreciative of the trust, because it's very, it takes a lot of trust for somebody to, um, to tell you <laughs> what your blind spots are. So I really appreciate that. And so this is the questions that we want to leave you with. Um, how do your cultural histories, racial identity, and the type of education you've received affect the way you teach and learn? How might you make your teaching more relevant and accessible to a wider spectrum of students? Um, and what kind of learning community or collaborative teaching might be possible for you? I just want to remind you very quickly that there is an exhibition happening in uh, relationship to these, this work. All of these students have work in that show. It's a very good show, so I highly recommend it. It is not in the booklets. So there are um, a couple of students handing out postcards, so please take one. The opening is tonight. They're going to kick me off the stage. The opening is tonight at, at six, 
6 o'clock, 6 to 8.30, no, 6.30 to 8, yeah. So you should come tonight and um, meet some of the students, talk more. I'm getting kicked off, okay. Here's some more resources. Maybe I'll put these on the thing, resources. Thank you.